lessons from this particular uh, innovation that may be applicable to the NCD community today. It's been 12 years since that discovery was recognized by the PMA. Awards were given for the development of ORT and the uh, subsequent uh, impact on health that was given, which some have estimated that there are well over 50 million deaths that have been prevented with oral rehydration therapy. We're very fortunate that we have a, an excellent panel that will talk about these issues. And so what we're going to do is to review the development of ORT and then look at the impact of this in Thailand. Let me introduce the four speakers for today, uh, and then each one will give their uh, oration. Uh, first is Dr. David Nealon, who was a graduate of the All Women Medical School, and after his residency in 1967, he joined the Colorado Research Laboratory, as did I, where the first of the successful clinical trials of ORT were conducted demonstrating an 80% reduction in intravenous fluid requirements uh, using this replacement solution. Uh, in 2007, David and myself were uh, the fortunate recipients of the Chris Meinigal Award uh, for uh, the work in ORT. Uh, David uh, then went on and became a director of clinical research and vaccine and scientific affairs at Merck Research Laboratories. And among many things that he accomplished, he led the development of the first successful hepatitis A vaccine. He is presently a professor emeritus at Albany Medical College and is developing new methods of vaccination. Uh, David will be followed by Professor Wan D, who uh, obtained her MD from the Chu Longhorn Hospital Medical School, uh, the University of Medical Sciences here in Bangkok in 1960. Uh, she was certified by the American Board of Pediatrics in 1965, and obtained a certificate in pediatric metabolism from St. Louis University, uh, Missouri in, in the US in 67. She has been serving as a pediatrician and facilitator in the pediatric department, faculty of medicine, relativity hospital uh, at Miami University from 1968 to the present, and still teaches at that school. Uh, in, in 2018, Professor Wandi was awarded, awarded the Tushdi uh, Malik Medical by the government of Thailand for her outstanding service uh, to the country over many, many years. This is Dr. Piana, who is a medical epidemiologist who's worked for the Ministry of Public Health for more than 25 years now. Uh, she was formerly director of the International Pool of Epidemiology Training Program and manager of the National Immunization Program. She was involved extensively in the process of new vaccine introduction to the national program and is currently a senior medical advisor for the Department of Disease Control, responsible for a wide number of programs, including vaccine preventable diseases, of which is what we're talking about uh, in the talk of coronavirus. Also, zoonotic diseases, emerging infectious diseases, as well as NCDs and health systems in the urban setting. And I am Richard Cash, uh, received my MD from the uh, New York University, or my MPH from Johns Hopkins. I literally began my career uh, a little over 50 years ago now in the same institution with David. Uh, we were NIH research fellows, and I joined the College Research Laboratory in Dhaka, which was then East Pakistan, and now uh, is Bangladesh. We're involved in the first clinical trials of ORT in adults and pediatric patients. I continue to teach uh, in infectious diseases as well as in research ethics, and along with David, with Dr. Dalit Mahalanis, and others, received the Prince Mahindal Award in 2000 and the 2006 award, but received in 2007, and also a recipient of freeze prize. I'm going to ask David to start out uh, with a general review of the development of ORT and its possible implications to NCDs. Members of the audience, um, today uh, I'm going to talk about the question of whether the successful development and implementation globally of ORT has any uh, information which would be helpful in the design, programs designed to control NCDs. Let's look at the events following uh, during the first 50 years after the pivotal initial trial, which was followed by a series of additional trials extending the work from patients in cholera uh, in shock due to cholera, the first study 
and then to non-colored diarrheas where IV fluids were almost totally obviated, then to children, then to colored patients uh, in shock without any IV, a small number of them under carefully controlled conditions, and uh, then the gradual acceptance and adoption by UNICEF and WHO of the goal of global control, um, missions to many countries over the world to help establish national diarrheal disease control training centers and ultimately uh, travel up from the medical establishment to the mothers, uh, making ORT part of the maternal repertoire and adapting clinical methodology and hospital study rooms to the bedside and village huts where simple clinical signs and symptoms replaced and taken out with measurements such as sunken eyes and whether the skin tense when pinched, things that the mothers could uh, absorb and uh, could uh, make oral therapy available shortly after onset in many cases uh, and also in cases that subsequently would need hospital care would keep the child alive <clears throat> until they arrived at such. But first and foremost, there was a validated scientific basis. Now, uh, in 2005, uh, Close One published a very interesting article by Ioannidis um, titled, The Most Studies Published in the Medical Literature Are False. And he showed why, and they are. Not, and this was before the recent rash of retractions, fabricated data, and a company and scale conflicts of interest and bias studies. He took it from the statistician's point of view. Most of the statistical tests reported were inappropriately used. Most of the uh, investigators had inherent biases which were influencing their interpretation. There was widespread misunderstanding of the significance of P is less than 05. And uh, by going study to study, he could show why most of them are not valid. So we start off with a big caution. Don't believe everything you read. And validated scientific basis means that we have to have a critical attitude of detailed examination of the science. Now today, since young, young and this, um, we've had the phenomenon of evidence-based medicine. And it started out with good intentions, but I must say I've been disappointed in the last five years or so to find that evidence-based medicine is more honored, honored in the slogan than in the fact many studies purporting to be based on evidence-based medicine, if you examine the evidence, it's not there. So I think we've gotten a popular slogan going without much impact on validated scientific basis. Now, ORT had the advantage that since about 1832, the dawn of clinical laboratory medicine, <clears throat> uh, the uh, basic pathophysiology, uh, first reported uh, by Herman and Janic in, in Moscow, uh, with the first measurements of uh, blood-specific gravity, uh, and they uh, reported that an important part of color pathophysiology was the dehydration. Uh, O'Shaughnessy read this report and re re reconfirmed it with his own measurements and remarkable for those days <coughs> went on to show that not only was there loss of water but there was loss of sodium chloride and bicarbonate and uh, he predicted that intravenous replacement would be a cure and then Lada, uh, the first read his articles and practice what he was advising uh, started the first intravenous rehydration of cholera patients with miraculous results um, for a short term. The problem was there were translational blocking issues. One, no knowledge of bacteria or sepsis. So those patients who did revive and return from the dead, uh, as he put it, uh, subsequently entered what he called the sep uh, febrile phase, which killed them, and that was septicemia due to use of non-sterile uh, reeds, silver syringes, the same instrument used for phlebotomy, the previous treatment, uh, and also the fact that the IV fluids he mixed, while they were in some, uh, pretty close, uh, at least in his second rendition, to the proper composition, matching the losses, um, they, he didn't understand the need for maintenance. And there were no cholera cots, no way, way of measuring the stool losses. So the patients were always on the edge of a cliff and many succumbed with the second wave of shock after he had first rehydrated them. So we had a 
causal paradigm, even though we didn't have an etiologic one, we had a treatment paradigm. And the question of translating to ORT, I won't go into that history because it's been immaculately published and you can, it's a free download on the web. Uh, just Google Joshua Ruxin, R-U-X-I-N, at um, Magic Bullet, the title of his article, and you can get it free, and he has meticulously documented by interviewing everyone who had anything to do with ORT and some people who had nothing to do with it. Uh, and out of all those transcripts, he wrote this longest article in the history of the journal of medicine. It had the advantages once developed of low cost and high availability, which intravenous fluids, although by that point available in major medical centers, were beyond, uh, were not available in rural areas affected by cholera and with high diarrheal mortality. An important point, um, which Dr. Cash has emphasized is uh, the, the value of having the researchers working on the problem embedded in the endemic area and getting the perspective of what the local people had, didn't have, what was needed to focus uh, the research on the goal of saving lives in those areas. Then the value of field trials and the support of the global organizations was of course uh, a tremendous uh, advantage for making it globally useful. Now, I think of the progress of ORT, and that's an analogy with NCDs, as uh, a series of paradigms. The pathophysiologic paradigm, dehydration and electron loss due to diarrhea. The therapeutic paradigm, replace the losses with matching values and matching solutions, IV or uh, with absorbable oral solutions. Lata bravely gave intravenous saline for the first time and witnessed the dramatic short-term recovery of patients. But he disappeared from the scene, and apparently, although there was plenty of cholera in India, uh, nothing carried over in the medical sphere as far as he was concerned. Then, some other professors were published letters to the Lancet around 1833, 4 or 5, uh, saying that they had found some evidence that Lada's method might work, uh, might benefit some patient, but they wanted to improve it. One of them improved it by adding intravenous milk. Another improved it by adding suffocation with a down pillow. All these improvements didn't make anything worse because the mortality was 100%. And with these improvements, it remained 100% for over 150 years. So beware of medical improvements. What about NCDs, non-communicable diseases, are in fact of microbial origin, of infectious origin. And um, uh, the importance of that basic science foundation in identifying the proper etiology and cause of paradigm is illustrated by the example of gastric ulcers. If we did not have the knowledge of the causation of gastric ulcers and gastric cancer by um, Helicobacter pylori today, we might be starting out an NCD program for gastric ulcers or gastric cancer for that matter, with the old causal paradigm of peptic type A personality, stress, hypersidity. The therapeutic paradigm was milk, would be milk antacids, H2 blockers, gastrectomy in most cases. And the political economic paradigm, promote milk production and uptake promote cheap antacids and H2 blockers, promote gastrectomy training, with the result of wasting millions of hundreds of millions of dollars on effort and achieving nothing. So we need to examine the true ideology of NCDs. As I say, in my opinion, many of them are already proven to be of microbial origin and many more will be, because this is the dawn of the age of the bio. Sitting here, standing here, watching you, each of you has 34 trillion human cells in your body. But, in addition, there are between 34 trillion and 100 trillion microbial cells living in your body, many of which have not yet been identified, but many of which that have been are known to produce oncogens, molecular mimicry with surface antigens, sharing antigenicity with human antigen. And uh, until we explore those and identify what's going on, what is the so-called normal flora of the heart, the lungs, the brain, the breast, only beginning to be scratched. The majority of fecal DNA, majority, is not human, it's viral. Chiefly phage, that's just a weak reflection of the fact that the phage are there to infect other microbes. So most of fecal DNA of humans is phage and other microbial DNA. There's a huge potential, a pathologic potential waiting to be discovered. It may not happen in one generation.
that behavioral habits are too deeply ingrained in a large sector of the population. 